Chapter Fourteen: The Peterkins' Picnic. There was some doubt about the weather. Solomon John looked at the probabilities. There were to be areas of rain in the New England states. Agamemnon thought. If they could only know where the areas of rain were to be, they might go to the others. Mr. Peterkin proposed walking around the house in a procession to examine the sky. As they returned, they met Anne Marie Bromwick, who was to go, much surprised not to find them ready. Mr. and Mrs. Peterkin were to go in the carryall and take up the lady from Philadelphia, and Anne Maria, with the rest, was to follow in a wagon. And to stop for the daughters of the lady from Philadelphia, the wagon arrived, and so Mr. Peterkin had the horse put into the carryall. A basket had been kept on the back piazza for some days, where anybody could put anything that would be needed for the picnic as soon as it was thought of. Agamemnon had already decided to take a thermometer. Somebody was always complaining of being too hot or too cold at a picnic. And it would be a great convenience to see if she really were so. He thought now he might take a barometer, as probabilities was so uncertain. Then, if it went down in a threatening way, they could all come back. The little boys had tied their kites to the basket. They had never tried them at home. It might be a good chance on the hills. Solomon John had put in some fishing poles. Elizabeth Eliza a book of poetry. Mr. Peterkin did not like sitting on the ground and proposed taking two chairs, one for himself and one for anybody else. The little boys were perfectly happy. They jumped in and out of the wagon a dozen times with new India rubber boots, bought for the occasion. Before they started, Mrs. Peterkin began to think she had already had enough of the picnic. What with going and coming and trying to remember things, so many mistakes were made. The things that were to go in the wagon were put in the carryall, and the things in the carryall had to be taken out for the wagon. Elizabeth Eliza forgot her waterproof and had to go back for her veil, and Mr. Peterkin came near to forgetting his umbrella. Mrs. Peterkin sat on the piazza and tried to think. She felt as if she must have forgotten something. She knew she must. Why could she not think of it now, before it was too late? It seems hard any day to think of what to have for dinner, but how much easier now it would be to stay at home quietly and order the dinner, and there was the butcher's cart. But now they must think of everything. At last she was put into the carryall, and Mr. Peterkin in front to drive. Twice they started, and twice they found something was left behind. The loaf of fresh brown bread on the back piazza, and a basket of sandwiches on the front porch. And just as the wagon was leaving, the little boy shrieked, "The basket of things was left behind!" Everybody got out of the wagon. Agamemnon went back into the house to see if anything else were left. He looked into the closets. He shut the front door, and was so busy that he forgot to get into the wagon himself. It started off and went down the street without him. He was wondering what he should do if he were left behind. Why had they not thought to arrange a telegraph wire to the back wheel of the wagon so that he might have sent a message in such a case? When the Bromwicks drove out of their yard in their buggy and took him in, they joined the rest of the party at Tatham Corners, where they were all to meet and consult where they were to go. Mrs. Peterkin called to Agamemnon as soon as he appeared. She had been holding the barometer and the thermometer, and they waggled so that it troubled her. It was hard keeping the thermometer out of the sun, which would make it so warm. It really took away her pleasure holding the things. Agamemnon decided to get into the carryall on the seat with his father and take the barometer and the thermometer. The consultation went on. Should they go to Cherry Swamp or Lone Town Hill? You had the view if you went to Lone Town Hill, but maybe the drive to Cherry Swamp was prettier. Somebody suggested asking the lady from Philadelphia, as the picnic was got up for her. But where was she? I declare," said Mr. Peterkin. "I forgot to stop for her. The whole picnic there, and no lady from Philadelphia." It seemed the horse had twitched his head in a threatening manner as they passed the house, and Mr. Peterkin had forgotten to stop. 
and Mrs. Peterkin had been so busy managing the thermometers that she had not noticed, and the wagon had followed on behind. Mrs. Peterkin was in despair. She knew they had forgotten something. She did not like to have Mr. Peterkin make a short turn, and it was getting late. And what would the lady from Philadelphia think of it? And had they not better give it all up? But everybody said no, and Mr. Peterkin said he could make a wide turn around the Lovejoy barn. So they made the turn and took up the lady from Philadelphia, and the wagon followed behind and took up their daughters, for there was a driver in the wagon besides Solomon John. Anne Maria Bromwick said it was so late by this time they might as well stop and have the picnic on the common. But the question was put again, where should they go? The lady from Philadelphia decided for Strawberry Nook. It sounded inviting. There were no strawberries, and there was no nook, it was said, but there was a good place to tie the horses. Mrs. Peterkin was feeling a little nervous, for she did not know what the lady from Philadelphia would think of their having forgotten her, and the more she tried to explain it, the worse it seemed to make it. She supposed they never did such things in Philadelphia. She knew they had invited all the world to a party, but she was sure she would never want to invite anybody again. There was no fun about it till it was all over. Such a mistake to have a party for a person and then go without her! But she knew they would forget something. She wished they had not called it their picnic. There was another bother. Mr. Peterkin stopped. Was anything broke? exclaimed Mrs. Peterkin. Was something forgotten? asked the lady from Philadelphia. No, but Mr. Peterkin didn't know the way, and here he was leading all the party, and a long row of carriages following. They stopped, and it seemed nobody knew the way to Strawberry Nook, unless it was the Gibbons boys, who were far behind. They were made to drive up, and said that Strawberry Nook was in a quite different direction, but they could bring the party round to it through the meadows. The lady from Philadelphia thought they might stop anywhere. Such a pleasant day, but Mr. Peterkin said they were started for Strawberry Nook, and had better keep on. So they kept on. It proved to be an excellent place where they could tie the horses to a fence. Mrs. Peterkin did not like their all heading different ways. It seemed as if any of them might come at her, and tear up the fence, especially as the little boys had their kites flapping round. The Tremlets insisted upon the whole party going up the hill. It was too damp below. So the Gibbons boys, and the little boys, and Agamemnon, and Solomon John, and all the party had to carry everything up to the rocks. The large basket of things was very heavy. It had been difficult to lift it into the wagon, and it was harder to take it out. But with the help of the driver, and Mr. Peterkin, and old Mr. Bromwick, it was got up the hill. And at last it was all arranged. Mr. Peterkin was seated in his chair. The other was offered to the lady from Philadelphia, but she preferred the carriage cushions. So did old Mr. Bromwick. And the tablecloth was spread, for they did bring a tablecloth. And the baskets were opened, and the picnic really began. The pickles had tumbled into the butter, and the spoons had been forgotten, and the Tremlett's basket had been left on their front doorstep. But nobody seemed to mind. Everybody was hungry, and everything they ate seemed of the best. The little boys were perfectly happy, and ate all of the kinds of cake. Two of the Tremlets would stand while they were eating, because they were afraid of the ants and the spiders that seemed to be crawling around, and Elizabeth Eliza had to keep poking with a fern leaf to drive the insects out of the plates. The lady from Philadelphia was made comfortable with the cushions and shawls, leaning against a rock. Mrs. Peterkin wondered if she forgot she had been forgotten. John Osborne said it was the time for the conundrums, and asked, Why is a pastoral musical play better than the music we have here? Because one is a grasshopper, and the other is a grass opera. Elizabeth Eliza said she knew a conundrum, a very funny one. One of her friends in Boston had told her. It was, Why is... It began, Why is something like? No, why are they different? It was something about an old woman, or else it was something about a young one. It was very funny, if she could only think of it. 
She could only think of what it was about, and whether it was alike or different. The lady from Philadelphia was proposing they should guess Elizabeth Eliza's conundrum, first the question, and then the answer, when one of the tremlets came running down the hill, and declared she had just discovered a very threatening cloud, and she was sure it was going to rain down directly. Everybody started up, though no cloud was to be seen. There was a great looking for umbrellas and waterproofs. Then it appeared that Elizabeth Eliza had left hers, after all, though she had gone back for it twice. Mr. Peterkin knew he had not forgotten his umbrella, because he had put the whole umbrella stand into the wagon, and it had been brought up the hill. But it proved to hold only the family canes. There was a great cry for the emergency basket, that had not been opened yet. Mrs. Peterkin explained how for days the family had been putting into it what might be needed, as soon as anything was thought of. Everybody stopped to see its contents. It was carefully covered with newspapers. First came out a backgammon board. That would be useful, said Anne Maria, if we have to spend the afternoon in anybody's barn. Next a pair of andirons. What were they for? In case of needing a fire in the woods, explained Solomon John. Then came a volume of the Encyclopedia. But it was the first volume Agamemnon now regretted, and contained only A and part of B, and nothing about rain or showers. Next a bag of peanuts, put in by the little boys, and Elizabeth Eliza's book of poetry, and a change of boots for Mr. Peterkin, a small foot-rug in case the ground should be damp, some paint-boxes of the little boys, a box of fish-hooks for Solomon John, an ink-bottle carefully done up in a great deal of newspaper, which was fortunate as the ink was oozing out, some old magazines and a blacking-bottle, and at the bottom a sundial. It was all very entertaining, and there seemed to be something for every occasion but the present. Old Mr. Bromwick did not wonder the basket was so heavy. It was all so interesting that nobody but the Tremlets went down to the carriages. The sun was shining brighter than ever, and Anne Maria insisted on setting up the sundial. Certainly there was no danger of a shower, and they might as well go on with the picnic. But when Solomon John and Anne Maria had arranged the sundial, they asked everybody to look at their watches so they might see if it was right. And then came a great exclamation at the hour. It was time they were all going home. The lady from Philadelphia had been wrapping her shawl about her as she felt the sun was low. But nobody had any idea it was so late. Well, they had left late, and went back a great many times, and had stopped sometimes to consult, and had been along on the road, and it had taken a long time to fetch up the things, so it was no wonder it was time to go away. But it had been a delightful picnic, after all. 